going to get started. So good morning, everyone. Um, I hope you're feeling well today. Uh, I'm Mickey Campo, a program manager at Innova Innovation Guelph. And for those of you new to IG, I just want to let you know really briefly a little bit about us. IG is one of a group of regional innovation centers located throughout Ontario. And while we do service Guelph and the Southern Ontario catchment areas, we actually have programs and services to support innovative and scalable companies of all sizes throughout Canada. So I welcome you to check out our website for more information at www.innovationwealth.ca. But that's enough about us. Let's get focused on helping you. So today I'm pleased to introduce you to Paul Ridkowski. Uh, Paul is an internationally awarded therapist, speaker, and founder of the Life Recovery Program. In addition to his extensive work in, me in mental health, he has consulted with countless organizations regarding the importance and implementation the psychological health and safety, resilience, and wellness programs all over the globe. So before I hand things over to Paul, I have a couple of housekeeping items just to go over with you. Um, the session today is being recorded and will be live on our YouTube channel within the next 48 hours. Uh, all attendees right now are muted, so um, you can either have your videos on or off, that's up to you. Um, uh, and you know what, if you would like to answer a question of Paul or of Innovation Guelph, please just raise your hand. Uh, use the raise your hand option in the lower right corner of your screen, or you can type in a general question in the general chat window to everybody. And I will um, make sure that Paul gets your questions and we will talk about that when Paul opens up the floor to questions. So he will do that a few times throughout the presentation. Um, feel free to ask your questions whenever you have them and we'll draw back to them. Um, and you're welcome to stay for the last half hour at noon. We go to an open Q&A session and you are welcome to stay and ask your questions then. Um, but if you have to leave and get on with your day, then that's up to you as well. So Paul's going to try to get in his whole presentation uh, to finish right around that noon time slot. So before I hand this over to Paul, um, if any of you have any questions right now, um, start typing them in, I will answer them on chat and we'll go from there. So Paul, please take over from here. Okay, well, thank you, Mickey. And thank you folks at Innovation Guelph and appreciate you folks joining on the line and taking uh, some of your valuable time to attend this webinar. And how should I start off? What can I say? Life is stress. Any questions? No, okay. Oh, we'll get to other stuff. I just want to draw your attention to my blue acoustically enhanced shirt. And if you notice the acoustic paneling, hopefully that's uh, everyone's getting the sound okay your way. And if not, raise your hand. No, okay. I probably couldn't see you and you probably couldn't hear that anyway. So um, many of us in the last few weeks obviously felt like our world has been turned upside down and probably not just um, once having it turned upside down or the pronouncement of the pandemic, but, you know, it's big news to obviously, you know, swallow. And then it's, we feel kind of maybe a new normal for a little bit, slightly adjusted, and then it gets turned again and there's new information. So we're constantly kind of feeling shifted and what have you. And that obviously creates a lot of stress and uncertainty and feeling pretty beat up. I did a workshop like this um, live. It was back March 12th, the day after the pandemic pronouncement and really about stress management and resilience, which you'll be um, hearing about today as well. And the folks were just obviously reeling with the news and I uh, just said, you know, show of hands for those of you, you just got a lot more stress in your life and life just became way more complicated for you. Interesting at that time, maybe only two thirds of the hands were raised. And I asked, uh, how many of you, your concern is more for yourself? No hand was raised. How many of you are concerned for a loved one? probably about two thirds of the room, uh, if not more than that, if their hands were raised. And uh, so obviously people are feeling concerned about themselves, if not a loved one as well. I used to work in the Northwest Territories. I certainly saw a lot there, certainly a lot of emergencies and what have you. Um, I was in the Boreal Forest area, so there's a lot of forest fires. And uh, we had to hunker down, basically. We had to stay in our home because the pollution was really bad from the fires and basically stay and wait until we got the alert and the alarm would go off if that's the case, and then we'd be mobilized to, to you know, kind of go with plan B in terms of the emergency plan. But essentially, we kind of had to wait out the firestorm, if you will, and um, wasn't a fun thing to do, and there's some similarities right now. There's certainly some differences as well with this pandemic. And uh, so I'm, I've been fortunate maybe in some ways to be, you know, 
not having a lot of infrastructure um, and uh, just being able to, to ride things out. And so it's about really riding out the storm in this case. And I'm trying to advance my slides. And there we go. OK. So actually, what I'd like to do is start off with you folks in the privacy of your own home. I'm just going to invite you just to take four deep breaths. So ready? Just inhale. Slowly exhale. Another deeper, longer breath in. Slowly exhale. An even deeper breath this time. Slowly exhale. And one more deepest breath you can. And slowly exhale. And despite all the noise going on out in the world, just notice what's going on in your mind body right now. And isn't it nice to know that you can just take a moment, just maybe reduce some of that noise, at least in here, and breathe and get grounded. So some good news. The news has been inundating us with um, just very not so pleasant stories, negative news. Here's some good news. Perhaps you heard of this fellow. His name is Ruben. On March 15th, he was diagnosed with COVID-19. And this is concerning. He's 99 year, years old, certainly. Uh, Ruben, not so much. He apparently has dementia, but certainly his daughter was very concerned and other family members. And although it might have seemed touch and go for a while, and this was in a, a retirement home, a nursing home. And just a, a number of days later, back on the 25th, actually, of March, he was declared COVID free and um, obviously a huge relief, not just for he and his family, but hopefully for us as well. I was going to Costco not too long ago, and this kind of was the observation I made. You know, stuff has hit the fan, and toilet paper has become the new currency. So let's remember to support one another as well, together in this as part of the global community. A little bit about me, and I used to work, I, I'm a clinician, I've been doing what I've been doing for a couple decades now. Uh, about 15 years ago, I did work in the Northwest Territories and Northern Alberta and you know, British Columbia, and certainly saw, you know, supply here, or rather demand for services here, supply down here, got tired of seeing people bleed and die in the gaps. So we created a, an online a program that uh, self-directed that has helped thousands of folks and actually saved jobs, families, and uh, lives. And so I've been very fortunate with my peers to uh, just receive outstanding awards for mental health, addiction, or innovation. And what we'd like to do is, um, we're gonna make this program, I'm calling it Inward Strong, actually available to all of you in the Innovation Wealth community. And I'll share a little bit more about that as well. So here's our objectives for today. I wanna to spend a little bit of time just normalizing some of the response to the very stressful and less than normal stuff going on. And uh, basically help you come up with some understanding and some tools and resources I invite you to have a pen and paper with you, or at least an electronic device. And uh, so you could take notes and we'll go through this high level, but certainly this could be something that you could take ongoing throughout the days. And we're gonna discover what your life accounts are in terms of how keeping your sort of self talked up in various ways, what you have control over versus don't. And that could be a powerful uh, just uh, release for a lot of folks and quite liberating in some ways. And then just to overall uh, evidence-based um, mental health hygiene tools and resilience tools. Now you're gonna have far more brain systems, circuits and cells dedicated to this material. If I just invite you just for a moment, just to pause and reflect. What is your purpose for this workshop? How might this information benefit you personally, professionally, perhaps a loved one? Just take 20 seconds or so. What's your purpose? for this presentation. Awesome, now that you have a sense of purpose, what I'm gonna invite you to do, if you're on your own, you have more systems, circuits, and cells dedicated to this material, if you actually write out what your purpose is, just write that out, or, if you're with a partner or loved one, just go to that loved one and just go, hey, what do you wanna get from this workshop? 
and just take maybe 20 more seconds to do that. And that'll give your mind a sense of focus and purpose um, for this presentation material. And what I'm gonna do in that time is just gonna just turn off the camera so your focus would be my, my own video here. So you'll be purely just focused on the material. Okay, awesome. I could sense the frantic typing or writing going on and maybe sharing with your neighbor what you want to basically get out of this and uh, awesome. So this is a bit experimental, this workshop. Uh, was, uh, folks at Innovation Guelph appreciate them asking me uh, last week to put this on. This is kind of an amalgamation of various presentations and uh, just trying to keep it to, to the essential as much as possible. Um, but certainly like to get your feedback at the end of this as well. So you're welcome back. It's a question I ask folks, so maybe write it down, record it somewhere. On a scale of one to 10, what is your stress or demand score? 10 being the most severe. On a scale of one to 10, what is your current stress or demand score? And just jot that number down. And some of you might be go, oh, forget the one to 10, Mr. Blue Shirt, acoustically enhanced, I think not. Might be more about, yeah, I'm at a 15 right now. We'll just write that score down. Now, stress in and of itself is one aspect of the equation. What's your resource score? Your coping score? Let's call it your self care score. Stress can be quite high, and I've kind of deliberately made the demands on the left a little bit bigger than probably what our resources feel like right now. But what's your coping score? Although stress can be high, if we have a su sufficient coping score, and hopefully add some resources to that and resilience tools in your toolbox with that, then that can help offset some of the demands and stressors going on. So just jot down a scale of one to 10, 10 being the most resource, the best coping, just jot that score down if you will. And there's no wrong answer here, whatever comes to mind. Awesome. Now that you have your kind of score and scale of one to 10, I'm just going to invite you, we're going to explore these as we go through this presentation. What are some of the current stresses in your life? Maybe your, your top main ones there. Maybe it feels like a gazillion, but uh, just write out some of your current stressors. And we're going to just ex go back and explore those later in the presentation. What are your current stressors at home, at work, combination? Okay, thank you for doing that. And we'll go back to that. Resilience is basically persisting in the face of adversity. It's about managing our resources, especially during difficult times. And certainly when I was in the Northwest Territories and there was lots of stressors, fires literally and figuratively going on, it's about how to manage one's energy and one's team if need be as leaders and business owners. And of course, it's hard to persist, persist in the face of adversity and uncertainty when our energy is low. So hopefully we're going to just uh, put some more kind of uh, points into your resource kind of energy score as well. Some of us with uh, being in a small business are the CEO or chief of everything officer. And I know that feeling as well. And um, already it can be challenging when you're in normal sort of day to day with other stressors going on. It can certainly be gas in the fire in terms of challenges. And the better you do, often is the better your business will do as well. The way I see it, well, how do we know we're resilient unless we experience some adversity? Unless we're faced with stressors, whether it's a person or a system, adversity puts our values in focus. And perhaps you've noticed you've been focusing more, some folks kind of, they've been living for their likes on social media, and perhaps that isn't quite as relevant as much now as is family, maybe connecting with your faith or what have you. The little saying I have is when I, you know, when forged in the fires of life, daily stressors don't burn you. 
So let me just normalize uh, what's going on. As human beings, first of all, with the pandemic and the declaration of that, I saw it coming back in January, <laughs> having worked the territories, I'm uh, become more aware of um, just smoke brewing, fires brewing, and I'm pretty good at smoke detection, fire detection. So I wasn't too surprised when the pandemic uh, declaration was made earlier last month. I kind of suspected that for a good six weeks or so. However, it's still like watching a train wreck happening in slow motion and not sure what's going to happen. And all things being equal, rodents, primates, certainly as human beings, low control and low predictability is stressful. So I just want to share this. Um, you probably heard this story of um, the, old, uh, the old farmer. And um, this just puts things in perspective. And the, the Asian saint of this is Seyong Jema. And so there was an old farmer, and he basically, his business was farming, and he had a horse, and which helped with his business, and just you know, as a companion to him as well. And one day he lost his horse. His horse ran away. And his neighbors said, you know, gosh, that's just terrible. You know, but, you know that must be just, you must feel so poorly about that. And the farmer basically said, oh, you know, good, bad, who knows? Only time will tell. Well, the horse did return with another horse. So the farmer now had two horses instead of one. And the neighbors said, well, that's great fortune. How lucky you are. And the wise man basically said, you know, it could be good. It could be bad. Who knows? Only time will tell. Well, his son rode this horse and, you know, soon after and ended up breaking his leg. The neighbors again said, that's terrible news. It's so such bad luck for your son. Again, the response, good, bad, only time will tell. Well, as it turned out, their nation went to war. Every younger man was recruited. Many lost their lives. The son was spared because he couldn't fight in that war. And so the neighbors again said, well, you must be very fortunate and glad. And again, the wise response was good, bad, only time will tell. And basically, this is a lesson in equanimity. This is a lesson in this too shall pass. And who knows what the outcomes um, could be, potentially be. And good, bad, only time will really know. So he might be familiar. This is Maslow's hierarchy of needs. I love this model. Most of us pre-pandemic were in the upper end of this pyramid. So the love, belonging, the esteem needs. What's stressful is we've just been knocked down a couple of pegs here. We've been knocked down in terms of certainly a feeling of safety, in terms of maybe even physiological needs. Is there enough toilet paper at the Costco for anything? And as you can imagine, when that happens, that is stressful. And basically these bottom two are more like psych phys sorry, physical needs and the upper three are psychological needs. So right now, most of us are in survival mode and just trying to restore a sense of safety. And that's what control and predictability brings on us. Um, for me, I don't know, getting knocked down with a number of fires and other literal and figurative fires in the territories. Um, in some ways, I figured that it feels like that was a bit of an inoculation for me in more difficult times currently. Here's what else might be going on. How many folks, kind of reflective question and somewhat rhetorical because they can't see you, are really bored. I'm just feeling like I'm going out of my mind here. I'm in this self-quarantine thing. And just, it's, it's, uh, it's kind of taxing. Well, I just want to normalize boredom itself can be stressful. University of uh, Western, or sorry, University of Virginia, participants were basically told to participate in unpleasant tasks. And one was actually, one task was they, you know, basically received a mild electric shock. Afterward, as you can imagine, all the participants said they would rather pay money rather than be shocked again. Or would they? When left alone, they were told they would be alone for another six to 15 minutes in kind of just a very neutral room, no phone, no device, and just left alone in silence. They didn't really appreciate that. We're not very good at doing nothing or being bored, maybe left with our thoughts. 67% of men actually chose to shock themselves and 25 women, 25% of women chose to shock themselves. 
So just be mindful that perhaps you're experiencing boredom and why in itself can feel um, like a bit of a stress response. Just want to normalize what's going on for folks. Grief. Now these aren't stages. Elizabeth Kubler-Ross basically said if these aren't stages, it's more of a process. And it's often a non-linear process. So some of us might still be in shock or denial. I can't believe this, this issue is happening. Some of us might be in a sense of anger or anxiety, you know, and usually it's when these emotions are really high that we'll experience, you know, and when our demands exceed our resources, that's where anxiety and anger will typically happen. For some, you might be in a stage of bargaining. Well, you know, in two weeks, it'll all be back to normal. I'm sure it's going to be just fine. Well, maybe that was two weeks ago and things don't seem quite as fine. So you might be in that sort of bargaining stage. Depression, the next one. Ugh, darn if I do, darn if I don't, things are still stressful. I feel like I'm in limbo. And sometimes this could feel like a sense of learned helplessness. Learned helplessness, I feel like, I, you know, wherever I do, it just feels like I'm kind of stuck in this. Finally, and probably many of us are not at this stage just yet, and again, it's a process, it's non-linear, it goes back and forth, it might be acceptance. And it might look something like this, you know, this is not a good situation. I do feel stressed about it, but you know what? I certainly do what I can to ride out the storm. And just pause, take a moment. What stage or stages might you be at right now? Is it bargaining? Maybe I can make this go away somehow. These problems, if not out there, but perhaps kind of in your own sort of business or home. Is it a sense of sadness and depression? Where were you two weeks ago? And this can be a useful model. Where is your maybe business partner or life partner at in, these, in this process? Where might your children be at in this process? And what's helpful for this model is often it brings a sense of understanding. And when we understand things better, provide some context, uh, context to what's going on, often that can help reduce our stress response. And basically we're all in a sense of limbo, what's gonna happen or loss and transition. And this is kind of a, another take on the sort of stages or process of change, if you will. Again, nonlinear process, which can be very crazy making and feel exhausting. But certainly there's an ending, there's a big dip, and that's where stress symptoms will be kind of at their peak in the exploration stage. And then as you've probably weathered many storms and transitions in your life before, it becomes the new normal and we adjust and we grow. And as individuals, and perhaps as many even businesses, they pivot and grow. I'm thinking Zoom right now is probably flourishing, um, just given what's going on and being a primary source of communication, as an example. So said another way, I think it's important to know this, we're kind of going from what was known and familiar in the last few months to what's now, this is really fuzzy and you know foggy. And when we're in the fog, things are foggy. And so what we're in a stage right now is the unknown, unfamiliar. Eventually, things do become more known and familiar. Said another way, things back maybe a few weeks ago were more predictable and controllable. Right now, we're in the middle of it. Things are not so predictable and controllable. As we know, in time, things become back to normal. Balance balance right now or chaotic being in the midst of it to new balance and new normal so what i encourage you to do to you know as much as you can tip you know main tip here keep your routines i'm sure they've been altered but keep those routines that you typically have as much as possible i'm a guy i have my piano i like to get on my piano every now and then i have a certain routine for that get up at a certain time every day my body and my body clock appreciates that i work out at certain times of the day or week and I'm maintaining those routines as much as possible. And I would encourage you to do the same and certainly be gentle with yourself and others. And with these models, basically it's about acknowledging maybe what losses have occurred, maybe bringing closure to what's ended, 
maybe that seems too soon for some, that's okay. We're not at the acceptance stage just yet. And maybe focusing on the moment as we did when we, we took a breath and just being in that moment for a while. This is a great model. Some of you folks might be familiar. I think it's called, uh, pronounced Rahi, the Holmes and Rahi basically stress scale. These two researchers, this was done some decades ago, had this inventory. And I encourage you, you could look up some of your points right now. It was basically, um, they called it the Life Change Units, LCU. And it was about uncertainty and transition. And you could probably add up some of the points you're experiencing right now, maybe at number 15, a business readjustment at 39 points. It may be a change in health, and that's points. It may be a change in schooling or church activities, number 35. Change in social activities, for sure, just about every one of us, that's 18 points. And basically what they found, this is to help normalize. The higher the points, obviously, the higher the stress. If you notice, there's some good things in this chart. Um, you know, gaining a new family member, let's consider that a good one. Um, what's some of the good ones here? Vacation at 41. These are good things. A job promotion even can be a good thing. However, it's that uncertainty. It's that transition. It's the going from the known and familiar to the unknown and unfamiliar. And typically this increases our sense of stress. So just being gentle with that. And the higher the score doesn't mean the higher the freak out kind of thing hopefully going on for you. The higher score you have is an invitation of maybe more self-care, as much self-care as needed in looking after yourself. Then certainly discussion with how to flatten the, the, the uh, viral curve and surgeon services. So how do you flatten your stress curve? Right now it's okay not to be okay. And as we know, every storm in life will eventually pass. I'm just curious reflective question what's helped you weather other storms in your life what are some resources that have helped you before maybe just jot some of those down or reflect on those what's helped you weather storms in the past that being said maybe what's helped you so far, just cope with the news, the transition, the limbo, the loss. What's helped you cope with so far in the last few weeks? Is it reaching out to someone? Maybe reconnecting with your faith, going for walks. We're trying to build your resource score. I don't think you folks would be here today if you didn't have skills and resources that made you through life and its storms thus far. If it's worked in the past, Perhaps some of these resources can also work in the present and the future. I think more than ever, what the world needs is a sense of compassion for self and others. And often what I want to normalize here is sometimes there's a feeling of terminal uniqueness. Am I the only one feeling this stressed out? Am I the only one thinking these thoughts? Gosh, I just feel like I'm just drowning in them and I just feel like, am I the only one? You're not the only one. The world is hurting. And self-kindness versus self-criticism is essential. So this is the work of uh, Kristen Neff, uh, self-compassion. And basically, you know, being gentle with yourself, especially when things are having, having some difficulty versus being self-critical. The second thing is a common humanity. You're not alone. These are pretty universal experiences that pretty much the entire world at this point is experiencing in terms of stress. And mindfulness, just maybe being aware that we're hurting as opposed to trying to push it away, and push it down. I'm gonna invite you, I'm just gonna read this slowly and gonna wait 30 seconds be between these steps just so you can write down the response to this or just so you can reflect and digest it. So number one, I encourage you to think about times when a close friend feels bad about themselves or is struggling in some way. How would you at your best respond to your friend in this situation. And just reflect or write down what you typically do 
in what you say, and note the tone in which you typically talk to your friends. Next, think about times when you feel bad about yourself or are struggling. How do you typically respond to yourself in these situations? Write down what you typically do and what you say, and note the tone in which you talk to yourself. Next, do you notice a difference? Like many of us, you probably do. We have a different standard for self versus others. If so, why? What factors or fears maybe come into play that lead you to treat yourself and others so differently? Finally, Write down how you think things might change if you treated yourself like a close friend when you're hurting or suffering. What might change if you were to give that same sense of care and compassion to others if you gave that sense of care and compassion to yourself? Next, we actually pay a lot of money to be stressed. Believe it or not, not in these circumstances, typically. Stress is stimulating. Some people go to a scary movie or ride a roller coaster. Too little stress is boredom. And as we found out, sometimes too much boredom can be stress in itself. And we're checked out. We're not performing very well. There's the elusive, this is from the, it's called the Yerkes dots and inverted bell curve or the stress performance curve. Then there's the elusive zone. And I'm sure you've all experienced this, maybe when you're kind of in a high sense of performance or achievement, maybe as athletic activity, you lose almost track of time, you are just rocking it. And you need stress for that. You need a certain amount of stimulation. Stress in and of itself isn't a bad thing, it's a mobilization response. And then on the right side of the scale is too much stress. Okay, you know what? can't concentrate, I'm sort of feel like I'm jumping out of my skin here, and that certainly can affect our performance as well. Usually with myself and with clients, I check in. I go, I just wonder where folks are at on this curve. Where are you at on this curve right now? Maybe what's helped you to kind of get maybe a little bit more into your zone in the past? If nothing else, this is here just to normalize. Um, maybe what's going on for some of you folks. Now, this is going to sound weird, but in our Western society, we're so busy in our head, especially, um, often we're not even sure when we're stressed. And we're going to impact this uh, a little bit. And how do you know when you're stressed? What are the signs? And I'm just going to invite to um, just to sort of unpack the physical aspect, because often we don't, a lot of folks don't live from the neck down. We just sort of turn off that information and consider it noise. And sometimes we're not sure that we're stressed until we're already jumping out of our skin. And it's very obvious to others that we're basically at a red light. How do you know when you're stressed? What's going on for you physically? It's let's say a seven, eight, nine, ten level of intensity. Is it the heart racing? Is it sweaty palms? Is it, you know, the stomach's doing something? Jot that down. Perhaps you never really thought about this before or were invited to think about this before. I'm inviting you to think about this now. How do you know when you're stressed, when you're redlining? What are those sensations going on for you? Now, given what's going on, I mean, some folks might go, I don't know, I just feel like a, just a ball of tension. Um, just be mindful of that as, as um, you know, throughout the day and week. And I would imagine probably most of you, not all of you, that's okay, would have your red light. Gosh, I know I'm stressed when, 
you know, my fists are all clenched and what have you. What's the more subtle signal? I hope that's supposed to be an orange color, but what's your orange light? What's your midline, your mid-level of stress? Your stress that may be a level four, five, six, let's say. How do you know when you're starting to get stressed, but not super stressed, you're kind of in the, the, the mid-range there? Is it a, maybe your shoulders get shrugged? Maybe, you know, there's a, a tingling you get somewhere in your body. So try to identify physical sensations. So just take a moment. What's your mid-level stress, your orange light? And just jot that down. You know, perhaps some of you have this level or a, a level of awareness. If you don't, that's okay. I just invite you just to be mindful. Now, the most subtle, and this is the tricky one. How do you know when you're at a level one, two, or three? stressor going on, the stress physiology, something going on with your body. How do you know when you're starting to get stressed? Before it completely hijacked and derailed, actually when neuroscience scientists said, you know, and basically when we're majorly stressed, our reasoning goes offline, we get to more of an emotional response and we lose almost 15 IQ points when we're majorly stressed. That's why the reasoning kind of goes offline and we're in a fight or flight basically state. So some of you, this might be, I don't know, I don't get it. You know, my body is just telling me I'm really stressed right now. That's okay, there is a lot going on right now. But just, just be mindful. You might even ask a close, you know, someone close to you, how, what do they see when you're stressed? And they can maybe help you. This is how this can be helpful. And I'll share a story. This is all about mindfulness and before things kind of get hijacked and derailed, kind of um, catching, you know, catching things at a lower level before we get the hijacking. And I was meeting with the nurse in my practice and uh, essentially she was quite stressed and she was using substances to basically self-medicate and she realized that's not a good long-term coping strategy. And I asked, how do you know when you're stressed? And she said, well, you know, my stomach gets a bit tense. And I go, is that a low, medium or high level of stress for you? Low, she said. What else do you notice? Said, you know, my chest gets tight. Okay, is it a low, medium or high indicator? Medium, she said. What else do you notice? She said, gosh, when I'm really stressed, my throat, my throat gets constricted and it feels like someone's crushing my throat. Low, medium or high, I asked. That was her high level of stress. And here was very hierarchical in her body from bottom to, you know, to top. But guess what she was able to do in the subsequent weeks? Before it got to that red line level of stress, her throat's all tight, she was able to catch it at the mid level and maybe take a break, take a breath. And before it got to her mid-level, her orange light, you know, it was her in a chest in this case, she was able to catch it at the lower level. And she was able to cope with stress better, not be hijacked and engage in more healthier ways of dealing with that stress. And this could be very useful. You will get a copy of this deck, so you don't have to necessarily jot notes down. I think this is being recorded as well. So just paying attention can, um, can help you uh, just bring higher circuits back online and mitigate some of the stress responses. And stress affects us in oh so many ways and thoughts, emotions, and memories can all turn on the stress response. And again, these might be some things you might be noticing right now. So a little bit about mental health and stress. This is a healthy brain. This is some of the latest neuroimaging. If you're seeing, uh, hopefully that image is coming to you uh, live from here and wherever behind my desk here. And if you notice a smooth surface, this means there's good connections. The yellowish color means a good amount of activity. So this is not a picture, but this is a metabolically healthy brain. Smooth surface, good connections, light yellow color means good activity as well. Here's the next image. Ooh. This is somebody with a 38 year old, a 38 year old with a 17 year heavy weekend drinking. And how many of you think you might be seeing some damage going on here? Yeah, just go, mm-hmm. How many of you think you might be seeing a lot of damage going on? Just do an mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You're right. And it looks like someone poured acid on this person's brain. All substances are neurotoxic and they could beat up the brain pretty bad. Here's someone who's majorly stressed. What I mean by that, 
a major depression of two or more years. In typical anxiety and depression, there's the elevated level of the stress hormone cortisol. Cortisol is also neurotoxic. It can really beat up the brain. How well do you think this person is handling stress, making decisions, or handling life? Perhaps not as well as could be. And my typical workshops, I'll just highlight this today in this workshop. Uh, my presentations, I talk about the mind-body and how it's all connected, and of course it is. The mind is able to produce more stress than the body can handle. And these are some of the things that are being researched in terms of folks with anxiety and depression. In typical anxiety, there's the elevated level of the stress hormone, cortisol, as I mentioned. And again, that can beat up not just the brain, but the body pretty bad. There's osteoporosis mentioned there. And yes, depression hurts. I actually have people say, I feel it in my bones. And interestingly enough, bones don't regenerate quite so well with uh, major depression. And this is kind of how stress physiology works. If kind of rhetorical question, because uh, perhaps you can't respond. I'm just focusing on my deck as well right now. Can you guess what a zebra does when it sees its natural predator line? What does a zebra do? It runs. Yes, correct. And it runs like heck to try and get away from the lion. Can you guess what a gazelle does when it sees its natural predator, a cheetah? What do you think a gazelle does when it sees a cheetah? Run? No, not typically. Physiology is different. They have a different skill. The, the gazelle was scrunched down, hunched down, and remained perfectly still. And it'll just be, look, just as part of the scenery. And what is that gazelle hoping will happen? Hoping that the cheetah will just ignore it and leave or not see it rather. What's going on for that gazelle in that moment? Massive amounts of energy. So cheetah's gone, gazelle's safe. What do you think the gazelle does then? Oh, you know, maybe slam back some drinks at the watering hole. It runs like heck. Why? The gazelle knows if it doesn't run, run off and discharge all that energy, it will become sick. And as human beings, we have our frontal cortex, kind of our forehead, and we can come up with all kinds of ways and reasons to turn on the stress response. And that just kind of gets uh, stews with us. I know it's coming close to lunch pretty soon. Crude question, rhetorical question. How many folks ever had to puke, vomit, or upchuck? I'm seeing some nods. Some of you may be a little more recent than you care to mention. No judgment here, I understand. What does the body do when it has toxins inside? It lets them up and out. I had some food poisoning on a birthday a couple of years ago, the steak tartare. I will never do that again. And that process of vomiting is not fun at all. It is a short-term stress response. And it certainly might be even embarrassing if people are looking. But what's the experience afterward? I know it's a crude analogy. What's the experience after you've puked some stuff out? About 95% of us say relief. The body does that very naturally. Stuff, toxins inside, it lets it up and out, and we feel better. How often I see behind closed doors We've got grief coming up, pain. No, nope. got to keep that down. Yeah, well, there's a lot going on right now. No, no, got to push that down and keep that, you know, in check. That's, you know, that's going to lead to things being stuck. That's going to lead to becoming sick. And I'm not saying, you know, puke all over people per se, but uh, it's just being mindful of that. There's some ways that we could discharge that. And this is where, again, exercise could be very useful for that and some other tools as well. Quickly go over this. This is pre-pandemic. Drug abuse was its own epidemic. And also mental health as well. Drug abuse is the leading cause of death for North Americans under the age of 50. 14% of net annual profit loss is due to mental health issues. Most people actually wait six to 23 years before seeking help. And stigma, unfortunately, is still uh, an issue there. And the societal costs, human costs are quite great. And here's an infographic that you'll get to keep. There's obviously the effects on the individual. We talked about the stress response, mental health becoming medical concerns, and certainly that doesn't help with our immune system and certainly infections as well. Some things that employers can do to help in the middle part there, and some things that you could do uh, on your own as an individual in terms of the 10 healthy habits to mental health.
This is from the Canadian Center for Occupational Health and Safety. This is what's different about this COVID virus. We do have a very active fight or flight system. And right now it's highly engaged with the news and perhaps over engaged by perhaps watching too much news. Here's the thing. We rely on sensory inputs for our fight or flight system to kind of mobilize us to either take fight or flight. But what are we taking fight or flight from? A virus is kind of almost an abstract sort of concept for us. What makes it more complicated, we're more so in a freeze response, kind of like the gazelle, kind of like basically waiting, what's going to happen? I can't feel like I can fight this thing. I can't necessarily take flight from it. I'm just going to stay put. And, you know, that often makes this kind of stress response more complicated. We're to stay away. Uh, from folks. And again, I'm glad we're changing it to physical distancing versus social distancing. Yet at the same time, we're highly mobilized, you know, in terms of our stress response. If I can recommend, this will really do you some good. And if you haven't been doing it already, physical activity is therefore paramount. Okay. So pen, paper, or device. I think for sake of time, gosh, I'm really, this is where my stream of consciousness can sometimes become a river of nausea. Hopefully this is uh, some value to you folks. Um, bank accounts, when our bank account is low, what's usually our response? The lower the account, usually the higher the, our stress level is at. We don't want to bust that bank. How about for our own emotional, physical, spiritual, or social well-being? And I'm gonna just very high level this. I'm gonna invite you kind of more of a take home exercise for sake of time, but for each one in a scale of one to 10, where are you currently at? The top, your mental, emotional, 10 being the best, I'm doing great, I have stress going on, you know, and folks, but I'm still, you know, I'm there. Spiritual, and maybe that's just connecting with nature with meaning. We're meaning making and meaning seeking beings. Scale of one to ten, where are you got in that dimension? And just write down your score. Physical. Where are you in terms of your physical resource score? One to ten. Ten being the best. No, oh, doing great, no problem. And then your social score in terms of just connecting with others, let's say, relationships. And I invite you just to see what your score might be at right now or come back to it for sake of time. And then I invite you to reflect with this question, what makes it that score versus a lower number? Even if you set a two, what makes it that score versus a lower number? Maybe you're implementing a strategy that is helping. That being said, second question to reflect on, post workshop here, what would raise that score a point or even half a point? Maybe it's just connecting with a friend a little bit more often, whatever that might be. And social connection has changed. I like to look at things in terms of frequency, intensity, and duration. And the intensity, if we're to measure the physical proximity we're able to be with people and friends, that's unfortunately lacking. If we're going to put that, let's say, on the intensity dimension. So we're a bit socially, you know, distant, physically distant rather from from folks. However, I've heard from many people, the frequency of connecting with folks online and whatever you're using technology and the duration of connecting with folks has increased. Isn't it wonderful to know that although we can't be face to face in person with folks, the frequency and duration could actually have improved. Talking to one of her team as we checked in, she said, it's just so great to talk to a friend or a friend she had in Spain. It had been years and she was able to talk to that person for hours at a time. And that's certainly putting a resource in her, um, not just social, but her physical, her spiritual, perhaps mental as well. And it's been said in terms of we are social beings, a joy shared is a joy multiplied, a sorrow shared is a sorrow divided. I know I've covered a fair bit of material here. Um, 
And I think what I'd like to do is maybe go over some signs and symptoms and then perhaps we'll pause and pause there. So I'll go over these quickly uh, for sake of time. And um, these are some things to look for and um, they might be just being aware for maybe self and others in terms of stress and anxiety. So symptoms of anxiety, if you've got about a handful of these going on for about a month or more, now, again, we're at a different baseline right now. We've all got hit. Our baseline has taken a hit in terms of our usual coping and stress response. So be gentle with that. What were you pre-baseline with these symptoms? And you'll have a copy of this so you can see. Anxiety is typically about fear, fear of loss. And that's certainly a very, very normal response going on for most of us right now. Next, symptoms of depression. If you have a handful of these symptoms going on for two weeks or more, typically that might be a sign of depression. Again, pre-pandemic, what was your baseline? Where are you at now? And just be gentle. Most of us probably experience depression. Depression is a response to loss. So I would say, you know, one way to look at it is a response to loss. I just want to normalize that. Here's some signs of substance abuse and self and others. And the sale of alcohol in Canada has gone up 40% in the last month. And so just, you know, keep in mind, if it was considered, you know, more than the typical standard drink, more than these amount of standard drinks, and there's the breakdown there, will indicate risk use behavior, and that can lead to the brain, the organs, and all kinds of habit. With this slide, I'm going to pause. There's still some other tools. Gosh, the time has really gone on here. There's hope. I showed you some brain scans of someone who's actively using or impaired, neurotoxically impaired by substances. Here's someone later, one year later, not using. The same holds for major stressors in terms of depression or anxiety, if that major stressor is going on for you. So there is hope. Just gonna pause here. And I want you just to maybe write down what stood out most for you. And maybe if we can just open it up to maybe just a, a brief question. Um, and uh, then we can kind of resume and I'd certainly like to be able to provide some more tools for folks as well. So is there any question, comment at this point? Or just keep going, just keep going. Well, Brad, um, I'm just taking a look here. We don't have any particular questions that have come away, but I'll welcome you to. We do have some comments about how helpful this has been so far. So I think that that's great feedback. Okay. Um, but if anybody Good. has any particular questions for Paul, um, that now would be a great time to ask them or else we can continue on not so rushed and <laughs> finish the end. I know that I rushed you with a time check at 1145. Sorry about that. Is there any questions? Nobody's putting their hand up. Nobody's asking. So Paul, did you want to just continue? Yeah, let's just keep going. Okay. And I do want to, oh, gosh, folks, as I mentioned, this is a bit experimental. Kind of amalgamated a fair bit of material to do this just to normalize. I do want to share some more tools so um, we'll just keep going and then there could be maybe some some QA afterward as well. So thank you for your your patience folks and um, I'm glad you're getting some valuable. Okay uh, I got one before um, you start. Thus far. I oh, have okay. a question. So in terms of managing people what method do you suggest delivering this information to your employees? This particular information as in this presentation? On on mental health, just oh, what meant, you're sharing and the health. How do you how do you suggest delivering this information to your employees sure. so that everyone's healthy? Sure, absolutely. I would share this. Um, well, maybe this this will be recorded. So this recording, if it's do you think if it if it's resonated for you, perhaps it resonates with some of your staff. This deck, and um, uh, you know, it might be just inviting folks because everyone's kind of on their own at this point anyway, in their own sort of space. And uh, just maybe putting it out as, you know, I'm concerned about uh, everyone's well-being. Thought I'd share this link with you folks, this recording. And, you know, perhaps if you just do, just, a, you know, just tell me what you, you know, what, what were the highlights for you the next time we connect as a team? That would be, that would be my, my, my response to that. That's kind of high level. Great. Thanks, Paul. Okay. So maybe I'll keep going. And how are we doing for time, Mickey? Uh, 
Uh, we have about half an hour left uh, for questions and answers or ending the uh, presentation. So we're good. We're, we have good time. We have till 1230. Okay. So I can keep going with the presentation and uh, I, I think of another Absolutely. 10 minutes. Which, okay. Awesome. So again, I'll go through some of this high level. You'll get the slide for this. So things to look out for, maybe going back to the person who asked the question. Um, and again, people are pretty taxed right now. So this is pre-baseline pandemic. How did people sort of um, perform? Let's say it changes an attitude or behavior. I would expect all these, under these circumstances in extreme stress, um, there'll be changes certainly in attitude performance and what have you. So. Again, it's being gentle with that. That's the dip in the curve we're having right now. And I would think post-pandemic um, things will get resume a bit more back to normal. So strategies for supporting, certainly express your concern, suggest there's resources available. I'll be sharing a little bit more about Inward Strong, our uh, self-directed awarded online program made available for folks at Innovation Guelph. And um, ask how you can help. And if there's a safety issue, obviously safety is you know first priority and uh, getting someone resourced um, or you know maybe they need to you know stop work because there's a risk i'm going to talk a little bit about suicide there's been more calls in terms of um, crises lines for suicide be direct and ask if you suspect someone is suicidal just go gosh sue it seems like a lot's going on from you and when you say that you don't feel like being around anymore are you are you thinking of taking your own life I know that's a tricky conversation. I've had many of those. Your heart rate will be going and you might be redlining at that point with your own stress signature. However, that's tremendously validating for the other person. They're feeling heard and it actually minimizes versus increase, increases their risk. Here's, it's not bulletproof, it's a handy acronym, is PATH warm? These are some of the symptoms that you would see someone, um, basically if they're increasing substance use, they're threatening to kill themselves. Uh, they're just really feeling hopeless. This isn't bulletproof, but these would be some, let's say, flags to look out for. And of course, you know, referring people to appropriate services when need be. And the unfortunate is even pre-pandemic, um, this, this has been a concern for lots of folks. And here's just a, an article on how men not talking and uh, has, been, has been an issue. Now we're going to segue to reducing some of the noise going on for you. This is the way I see it. The noise of the news. You want to be educated about what's going on, not inundated. The way I see it, breaking news is usually about things breaking. And that could turn up our stress response, thoughts, emotions, memories. We, you know, it might be just about having just a routine check-in, maybe once or twice a day on the news. And this is where presenteeism comes in. That's the middle line there. Presenteeism was on, when I'm physically there, mentally I'm checked out. And not surprising, uh, I've been missing an appointment here or there. I've been forgetting things, dropping the ball a little bit, but given the amount of stress going on, this is probably most of us experiencing a sense of presenteeism. <coughs> so, oh, gesundheit. So, Here's what's called uh, cognitive distortions. This is from the School of Cognitive Behavioral Therapy. And this is the noise often going on in our head. And I'm gonna preface this with a bit of a story. This is a story of two scuba divers. And they both had their aqua lung, their oxygen tanks, the same amount of oxygen. They're going on a bit of an underwater expedition. They both become trapped. And one, both trapped underwater, one uses up all their oxygen, panics, and unfortunately dies. The other one is able to maintain a sense of calm, conserve the oxygen, conserving one's energy, and lives. Rhetorical and reflective question, which diver would you rather be? Question for you, was there ever a time when stuff was going on for you and your perspective helped. Your perspective maybe helped reduce some of the psychological, the stress impact of that situation. My guess is you wouldn't be here today if you didn't have that ability. Was there ever a time when your perspective might have hindered? Maybe it was a level two kind of issue in hindsight, but at the time your perspective made it an eight, nine, 10, you know, intensity issue. You've probably done that as well. I have. 
So the time that your perspective helped, how did you do that? Was it a mantra you said to yourself? And if it's worked in the past, that perspective having helped a difficult situation, how can you do that in the, in the present or future? And again, I encourage you to look up just some of these uh, conjure distortions that can, can play out in one's head. We all have them. And they might be really turned up now given what's going on. Let's focus on the last one, should statements. Trying to motivate yourself because you think should or must have or ought to do something. You know, I shouldn't fill this beat up. I should be over this by now and I should have it more together. Well, it sounds like you're shooting all over yourself. And I know what that sounds like. Perhaps you're shooting all over yourself. So just be mindful of that. And if you look up kind of distortions online, you'll see ways to, to, um, to uh, basically help challenge them. Stress is contagious. Emotions are contagious. Not only can we see it in someone's face, we could hear it in their voice. And if you're close enough to someone, you could actually, people, researchers have done, you could perceive fear-based sweat more than gym sweat. We have a stress response when we even smell someone who's had a stress response. And this makes sense as human beings. If there's something in this environment to be fearful about. There's something called emotional contagion. Actually, if you're interested, you could check out the emotional contagion scale, emotional contagion scale, and it'll kind of show you which emotions you're more susceptible to. Unfortunately, when emotions are high or anxiety is high, aggression can also be high. Anxiety and aggression, it's the same brain circuit, the amygdala is activated. If someone's being aggressive towards you, this is often a useful perspective. Just remember, they're probably quite afraid. What are they afraid of to be so aggressive? Doesn't make it okay, but it just provides some um, perspective. But in terms of displaced aggression, that's basically where someone of a higher rank, let's say the CEO didn't get the big contract, they dump on the upper management, upper management dumps on the middle management, that person dumps on someone of the team, that person goes home and dumps on their spouse. That's what displaced aggression is about. And given how, stress, how stressed we are and how much that amygdala is firing with anxiety, this might be something to just be aware of, hopefully not take personally, and or hopefully it's something you're not reducing your own ulcer by dumping on someone else and giving them one. So some tools. Scale and close balance, it doesn't take much weight on either side to tip it in that direction, toward the direction of illness or toward the direction of health. So these are some things that reduce cortisol levels and a sense of connection. And some of these are quite obvious. Your Uncle Sam and your Uncle, your Aunt Bertha, rather, your, your, your family equivalent might have been, you know, make sure you get outside, and go out and laugh and what have you. And journaling, I'm gonna spend a little bit of, just unpack a little bit. Lots of studies, journaling is a way to mentally detox. One study from the University of Cambridge, those who journaled versus those who didn't, and another control group, their wounds actually healed faster for those who journal about their inner sort of um, life versus those who just journal about trivial things. So they actually produce more human growth hormone. University of Austin, Texas study, they had uh, several groups. The control group don't journal at all. The other group just journal about your day-to-day -day stuff. And then the, the main group, they wanted to just sort of see what would happen. You journal about your traumas. They used the word trauma big T, little T, whatever that is for you, for 15 minutes a day for the next four days, journal about your traumas. Fast forward six months compared to the first two groups, the control group, and then the experimental group who actually journaled about their traumas, compared to their baseline, their blood pressure was better, their mood was better, they were more focused, they were sleeping better. This is the puking, not puking in other people. This is where talking to people basically can help not in an aggressive way. This is where some people in faith traditions go to, go to confession. If you're not able to do that, this is where some folks actually go to a counselor. A journaling can do that as well. My wife actually knows if I've been journaling like mad in the last few weeks just to get stuff out, if you will. And I start to feel it if I don't journal in a day or two, my wife starts to sense it as well. And she'll actually call me out and goes, have you been journaling lately, Paul? 
sleep, some good sleep hygiene tips, and especially I would encourage you not to look at the news uh, or any update and turn off that noise, especially before bed. You're trying to gear down versus gear up. Okay, I do want to hang out here for a little bit. I want you to get your pen and paper, your device. I want you to draw three circles. So the smaller inner circle, mid-sized circle around that, and then the larger outer circle. And this is inviting you just to reflect on what you actually have control over. I'm going to invite you to go back to your stressors list, a list of items that you wrote down. And I invite you to get that list and just put in what category you think those items fit in this sphere. Items that you do have control, high influence over, perhaps some of those items you have no control over, and some might sort of fit in between. I'm just going to invite you just to take that list of your stressors and just reflect, and as best you can, just see where they would fit within these spheres of control. And I'll just give you maybe half a minute to do that. Okay, for sake of time, hopefully you've got some things that fit in some of those categories. For some folks, this can often be the, I don't know where things fit. It's just a, it's just a blur. If that's the case, it sounds like a lot's going on. It's probably pretty overwhelming. Just be gentle with that. Maybe that's where something of this exercise could be shared with someone you trust or a loved one. But it might just be reflecting on where some of those stress items fit within these spheres. Now I want you to notice, now that you've got some items um, hopefully put in those various spheres in terms of levels of control, notice the size of those circles. Often we have control what's going on with ourselves. Even sometimes that feels out of control. Typically when I hear people say, I'm, I'm, you know, I have control over my thoughts, feelings, and behaviors, you know, maybe some influence of those closest around me, but there's a whole outer sphere and look how large that sphere is where there's no influence, no control. And really the way I see it, and I think this is where people find a sense of reassur reassurance, whether I worry or panic about it or not, that no control sphere, whether I worry, panic about it or not, it won't change anything out there. As much as I might worry or panic about that outer sphere, it won't change anything. And if we're trying to change things in that outer sphere and trying to control things that we clearly can't, that's called learned helplessness. Darn if I do, I'm darned if I don't, I'm stuck and feeling helpless. Your spheres of influence isn't this the serenity prayer at work? Lord, grant me the serenity to accept the things I cannot change. Courage to change the things I can and wisdom to know the difference. And perhaps instead of spending your valuable energy on things you clearly can't control and a diminishing return at that, focus on what you do have control. As difficult as it might be, first of all, so wrapping up here, continue to socially distance, sorry, physically distance. Oh, I wanted to change that. Wash your hands, tell the loved ones that you are close to, that you can be close to, that you love, well, the ones even that you're not close to physically, that you love them. I notice more people as they walk along the roadway in the park, keeping our physical distance, but they'll say hello, they'll make eye contact. That feels wonderful. That seems to be improving for many folks. 
thankfully. Maybe model that where you are. Take the time to reflect and count your blessings and appreciate every moment. And maybe just writing out what you're grateful for. Self-care is no longer a luxury, but a necessity. If you don't break, take a break rather, you will break. Be gentle. It's okay not to be okay, and every storm will pass. What has helped you weather other storms in your life? We're all in a state of loss and limbo and transition. Keep your routine, routines as much as possible, your self-care strategies, that routine as much as possible. I invite you to be gentle with yourself and others. I'm gonna invite you to do another breathing exercise. I'm gonna just kind of share what it's invo what involves and then we'll actually do it. We're gonna take a few breaths in through the nose, but we're gonna hold the breath as we inhale, exhaling through the mouth, holding the breath and pausing a few times as we exhale. So ready, inhale, hold, a little more, hold, top it up, hold, exhale through the mouth, hold, a little more, hold, let it all out. Same thing, inhale, hold, a little more, hold, top it up, hold, exhale, hold, a little more, hold, let it all out. And just give it one more go. Inhale, hold, a little more, hold, top it up, hold, exhale through the mouth, hold, a little more, hold, let it all out. And just breathe normally and notice what's going on for you mentally or physically. And probably go, what's with the weird breathing, Mr. Blue Shirt, Paul, whatever your name is? What were you thinking about as you were breathing in that kind of unique way? Probably on your breathing, not much else. It calmed your mind down. It calmed your body down. Win, win. Isn't it nice to know, despite all the noise out there in the world, just with our breath, that only took about 40 seconds, we could bring ourselves down a couple of notches in terms of stress and up not just in terms of relaxation. So basically summarizing, the research is clear. Move your body, quiet your mind, connect with others as much as you can. Live your sense of purpose or meaning as much as you can. Maybe a spiritual practice. These are challenging times, yet also an opportunity to set some positive habits that hopefully will stay with us for the rest of our lives. And perhaps our to-do list becomes our self-care list as well. So I'm just going to share a little bit about our program and how it could be provide you with immediate and ongoing support. Basically the idea was if you couldn't bring someone to a resource, let's bring the resource to the person that's very timely and topical these days. These are 24-7 issues we've been talking about in terms of mental health, behavioral health concerns. We better darn well have 24-7 support. So basically it's uh, video modules there's a do dozen of them and it's on-demand video coaching. And this will be available for you for the next few months, no strings attached, and we'll share a link with you just, just a little bit. It's all evidence-based tools and techniques, ways of staying connected and getting support. And we could use as much sense of community and support these days, um, given what's going on. And the program not just there for individuals, but also family members as well. These are some of the issues that we help um, and topics we address, and basically we're talking about resilience and mental health hygiene. And we've helped thousands of folks overcome many issues and sometimes, you know, some rather intense difficulties. It's not a crisis hotline. This is meant more for mental hygiene or if the symptoms are mild to moderate. And um, certainly has helped people just kind of normalize what's going on for them. It's about putting tools in your resiliency toolbox. Received a number of accolades and awards for doing this and endorsements. And uh, we're quite excited. We're just about to launch something with Cisco and um, as we move along. So, and I'll provide a link for that uh, so you folks can access again as an immediate and ongoing resource. Some of the hopefully information you found valuable today. There's lots more information, validation, and you know, uh, just tools in the program, Inward Strong program it's, itself. And at this point, I think we could all use to be a bit more fortified and inward strong. So wrapping up here, 
on a scale of one to 10, what was your coping score again? Go back, what was your coping score? Now, what makes it that score versus a lower number? I'm guessing you're doing something to help support yourself in some way. Socially, maybe a physical activity. What makes it that score versus a lower number? And ultimately, what can you do to raise your resource or resilience score by a point or even half a point higher? Maybe it's something you got from this presentation. What's one thing you can do to raise that score by even half a point higher? And just jot that down. And my guess is many of you will have an idea of how to raise your resource score. Awesome. You now have an action step of how to bring yourself into higher health and greater health. So this is what we've discussed today, normalizing some of the responses here, knowing your sphere of influence, some things that you can do, maybe just as simple as breathing to increase some of your scores. And you'll be getting a copy of, um, a copy of this deck with some additional resources. And this will be made, this is available right now in terms of uh, for you folks out there. So I thank you for your time. There's still time for some QA and or I'm gonna put it up this way if there's any questions or I'd be curious also to know is what's one thing you might do differently as a result of this presentation? Comments, questions, or what's one thing you might do differently from the information you've heard today? And we could just open it up for if there's any questions in the chat window. Yeah, so I'll, um, I'll ask that if anybody had any questions, just raise your hand using the, um, the tool on the lower right hand side and we'll get to you right away. Um, but while we wait, uh, Patricia had a question. She said, how can we assess our baseline before the pandemic and evaluating our baseline for now? So, and then what do we do with that information? Oh, yeah, good question. Um, I'd almost do a one to 10, just kind of a high level. So where was I at one to 10 in terms of my overall COVID? Pre-pandemic, let's say two months ago. And often people were pretty good at just kind of a subjective unit of, there's no right or wrong answer, of course. It's like, you know, maybe I was at a seven, I was a bit stressed. Okay, where am I at currently? My guess is because of just increased stress and maybe feeling less resourced and or overwhelmed, perhaps that resource score has gone down a little bit and that's okay. So just record that somewhere, put in today's date and what's that current, let's say coping score. And I would not be surprised if it's a little lower than pre-pandemic. Then I would just check in on that score. I would check on that score maybe in a couple months or maybe even weekly and go, where's my score at? And I often do this with clients face-to-face. -face. You know, what's your stress score? I have other metrics that we do in terms of maybe measuring anxiety and what have you. Um, you can certainly go online and if, if it's a, more of a kind of a concern of one of these common colds in terms of anxiety or depression, you could look up um, anxiety and depression inventories um, uh, evidence-based. Um, one is called the Beck uh, Anxiety, and there's a Beck Depression Inventory. There's one, something called the GHQ, General Health Questionnaire, nine and number nine and 12. They have nine and 12 items respectively. And you might just score that. There's some scoring items in the Inward Strong program as well. And just go, okay, it's good to know where my present baseline is, but I wonder, you know, yet I wonder where, you know, things are going to, you know, where I'll be at, my guess is probably more back to baseline as uh, things become a bit more stable externally in our outer world, which helps with our inner world, of course. I hope that answers your, your question. Thanks, Paul. Hi, Paul. Um, I have a question here, actually. Um, mm -hmm. Do you uh, find, you mentioned a little bit about substance abuse earlier. Uh, do you find that coffee and other uh, like caffeinated substances have a positive or negative effect on people's overall mental health? Sure. Uh, yeah, good question. That all depends. Uh, for example, I, I enjoy eating peanuts, peanut butter, 
and I can eat lots of peanut butter. But for some folks, they get a reaction to it, obviously. And for some folks, any substance, caffeine can be, uh, you know, more than two cups of coffee for a lot of folks can feel like a panic attack. I don't drink a lot of coffee, so that would certainly put me over the edge. If it's part of your routine, drinking coffee, great. Maybe, you know, if you're finding it might be a little bit harder to quit now, if it's keeping you kind of going, great. If it is detrimental and you find it just too jacked up, then maybe ease it back. Um, and uh, especially not later in the day or, or, or evening, because that'll affect sleep. I also like to make a comment, alcohol also affects sleep. I get a lot of folks, they say I drink, you know, a couple of drinks before I go to sleep. And um, basically, you know, caffeine stimulates the brain and caffeine is what's called a delta wave inhibitor. Our deepest delta wave sleep, we get knocked 20% each glass we have of a drink before bed. If I have two, three drinks before going to sleep, that 60% of my delta wave sleep is compromised. Even though I thought I had a, you know, good rest the next day, I didn't get that deep delta restorative sleep and I'm feeling really crap other than just maybe even hungover. So I, I hope that helps. So Wes, do you, if you have any more questions uh, to read, then I'm sorry, if you don't have any more questions, well, I'm going to unmute everyone. Um, mute yourselves again if you would like, but I would like to give you all the opportunity to make some comments or let Paul know what you've learned today. Um, offer any suggestions or questions. Um, let's have this be a bit more of a collaborative uh, conversation. Okay, so I've unmuted everybody. If you don't want to be heard, please mute yourself again. Is that, can I mute myself, Mickey? Am I good? It's Paul here? No, no, okay. <laughs> no, Paul, everybody wants to hear you. Oh, okay, okay. Um, so, so we still have some people online who are unmuted. Um, please feel free to mute yourself again or um, ask some questions. Let's have a conversation. You can tell a lot of people walked away from their desk there at the, at the last minute. <laughs> Maybe that wasn't the greatest idea. No, no, it's probably, I, I get it. It's the social distancing. You know, it's about, I don't take it personally. <laughs> That's okay. Sure, but so, if there's someone there who's within earshot, yeah, I wonder what, um, I'd be open to some of your feedback regarding this presentation. If you have a common question or maybe what's one thing that stood out for you or suggested. Or not, or not. no pressure. But caring is sharing. Maybe, maybe it's a shy group. Maybe it's a shy group. I have muted everybody again because we were getting a lot of background sound there. So um, I did put in that I allowed everybody to unmute themselves. So please do unmute yourself if you have anything that you would like to talk about here. Um, we do have 22 people online and lots of things were covered. Um, Paul, I would say that that was um, certainly an enlightening conversation. I think you should rent your voice out for some great meditation exercises when you had us all breathing. It was quite relaxing. Sure. Well, actually, those are in the program. There's many more as well. Just putting tools in your box, resiliency toolbox, and uh, just, yeah, there's, there's plenty more that you could do anywhere, anytime. That's wonderful. And just to let everybody know, we'll be sharing um, not only um, Paul's deck and a copy of the recording on our YouTube channel, um, but as well, uh, Paul's generous offer. If you want to go back to that um, page that shows that three months free. So um, we'll share this link with you. This gives all of you and your families three months free of the online um, services. So Absolutely generous. Thank you so much for that, Paul. I think you'll be helping out a lot of people through this. Right. Um, as, we, as we were talking, um, I got a notice from a friend of mine who lives in another city. Um, and there's a 33-year-old woman who was just murdered by her um, partner oh. um, in another city uh, far away from here. And it's all stress-related and emotional and very, very sad. I, there are a lot of things happening right now in the world and having something like this, a tool like this to help us is definitely um, a wonderful thing. Mm -hmm. So um, we do have a question. So Patricia, please go ahead. You can unmute yourself. 
Okay, thank you, Mickey. I'm unmuted. Okay, uh, so the question I have for you, Paul, is you mentioned about like this breaking news all the time, just um, bombarding our senses, right? Mm. Um, I've also noticed that there's a big rush, especially for um, business owners trying to get the very best information on productivity. And, and for those who are working at home, they're just bombarded with how to be more productive. Uh, I'm finding yeah. that to be uh, really difficult for myself and I have tuned out nearly everything except for Innovation Guelph's offerings because I'm, I'm just finding it's too much at the moment. Yeah. And there's a period where I know I am not going to be productive and, and that's being kind with myself. Um, I don't know when I'm going to take that turn and be, be productive again, but I don't need those kind of what they call productivity porn at the moment. Can you? Oh, comment? yeah, yeah. Well put. Yeah. Okay. Productivity porn. Yeah. Sorry. I'm just taken by that term and that ex I'm just taken by that expectation. It's just, yeah. Okay. So I, I, Patricia, is it? Yeah. Was that a, more of a comment or question? Oh, uh, well, I, I, it was both actually. It was okay. just to, for awareness for people online, but also for perhaps for you to respond on what, what is reasonable to expect in productivity at the moment. Yeah, I would say a lot less than it was pre-pandemic. And so again, our, our, our stress is, you know, and through the roof, you know, it's, Presenteeism, that's the term, basically. I'm physically there, but mentally I'm checked out, and that could be at home, you know, let alone, you know, work-related stuff. There's only so much mental bandwidth we have, and we've been inundated with just news and uncertainty and stress and, you know, on this kind of limbo of not knowing and not familiar. Um, you know, I, I would really hope, if you can hear me out there, business leaders, that you would just kind of ease up on, on that expectation for now uh, people are in survival mode. Think of that Maslowian hierarchy. They're kind of in that safety. It's hard to sort of, you know, establish, you know, productivity when people aren't even feeling quite fully emotionally safe right now. Look at that stress performance curve. Where are you at in terms of that? My guess is the far right end where it's really hard to be productive. Um, people are not going to be in the zone right now. And uh, I think it's I just want to validate. I think it's very reasonable for a time that people are going to be, you know, maybe half productive or a third. Take what you can get. That's not gonna be forever. It is what it is for now. The more we try and push, it's gonna create even more stress and more long-term issues down the road would be my thoughts on that. And Paul, I've got uh, one more question here. Um, when you do feel you're coming to that, uh, that breaking point, when it comes to stress, uh, what are some immediate steps people can take to try to uh, wind down and calm themselves? Sure, you know, if you're on your own and you're feeling just you've got nothing else going kind of in your immediate whatever sort of vicinity in terms of a, being able to reach out to someone, breathe. Just maybe just focus on your breathing as we did here. Um, do connect with someone, you know, you know, virtual chat, Skype, what have you. Go for a walk as much as that's kind of, um, you know, available to you and hopefully a park or maybe a green space. Bring a little book, bring a little journal, maybe just something that you can record your thoughts. You're probably kind of almost needing to just puke some of that stress out, if you will, figuratively speaking, and uh, maybe needing to share with someone uh, what's going on for you. Uh, maybe putting it on, you know, pen and paper and there's the kind of a physical and mental detox when you do that. If at all else, just just breathe. And maybe the Inward Strong Program can assist you with some things as well. If it's a really critical thing for you going on right now, then I hear 24 seven, I think with something, yeah, on the resources and information is where you could talk to someone and uh, and, and connect with someone if, if need be. Those would be kind of my high levels there, yeah. And be gentle with, with yourself. I encourage all of you to be gentle with yourself. We're all feeling pretty beat up and I just wanna normalize that we're all all being pretty beat up and just be, you know, do that self-compassion exercise we did uh, with how would you t say things to your friend versus how you would say it to yourself. And just think of your best friend, maybe changing your self-talk in terms of the negative talk we'd say to ourselves. what would my best friend share with me or say to me or what words of encouragement would they share with me right now in this moon of challenge that I'm having? 
And sometimes that in itself can just put things in perspective as well. Yeah, that, that would be my quick response to that. Wonderful. So I'm just going to do a little bit of a time check. I know we said this is over at uh, 1230. So we are at 1230. Um, I welcome a few of you to stay on if you have some more. I know Lucy wants to say one thing before she goes. Uh, but other than that, um, we can kind of wrap up for now. If you have any questions or you want to do any follow up or anything like that, please let us know. Um, we are offering a one hour free consultation that is a COVID-19 response for your business. So if you are someone who uh, is running a business and would like to talk to somebody for an hour at Innovation Guelph about your business and your plan and strategy to get through this storm, then we will absolutely um, uh, want to talk to you. So you have uh, an hour for free for that. I would like you to email either Wes or myself. Uh, we'll put all the links and information in a follow-up email we're going to send out to you. Um, but as well, I'll send, we'll send out a follow-up to this without all the, all the information that you need um, to continue on. So upcoming next, we have product development in a crisis, continuing through the innovation, uh, sorry, continuing the innovation through this, this time, a little bit of a collaborative effect. How can you help? How can you continue? Uh, then we have an HR culture and leadership implication of COVID-19 reality on April 9th. We have a PR strategy and communication. So what do you say? How do you say it? Um, and then uh, we have a business leader panel on April 17th, and that kind of wraps up the series. And that will be uh, leaders sharing their stories of coming out the other side of a crisis. So people who have been there and done that and learned valuable lessons, they'll be teaching them and talking about that. It'll be uh, rather uplifting not so doom and gloom um, about uh, you know, the crisis, but more about how do we get through this and you know what it can happen. So very, very clearly tied into what Paul was saying here today that we will get through this and there is tomorrow, there is a uh, kind of light after this storm. So we can do that together. I think uh, we definitely are stronger together. So we can continue helping however we can, just let us know. So. I'm going to stop talking. If any of you would like, uh, Lucy, I would love for you to say what you would like to say. So if you could unmute yourself, um, that would be wonderful. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hi, Hi Lucy. Uh Hi, um, I just, I don't have a question. I just wanted to thank you. Uh, thank, thank you, Paul, Wes, and Mickey for hosting this session. I found this to be very helpful. Um, I'm Lucy. I run Lulu Education, and we are a team of Canadian teachers who teach uh, kids online. And um, just before before we had this session, I had a lot of teachers who were expressing that they were feeling very overwhelmed, and um, some of them already have mental health issues. So um, I've been checking on uh, checking in on them uh, regularly, and just um, kind of uh, calming them and making sure that they're that they feel okay to continue to teach. And um, after after attending your session today, I found that now I have the relevant resources and more material that I can direct them to. So it's absolutely essential for um, helping to keep everyone's um, mental health, um, just um, uh, keep, keeping them uh, in check and uh, making sure that everyone's able to continue to do their job and feel okay during this time. So I really appreciate you guys taking the time to do this today. Thank you. Thank you, Lucy.